I can just hire you as my psychologist now, Trey. You can just be yes. my guy. Just say, let's go. Hey, Ryder Cup is next week. Yeah. You need to win this week. Let's make it happen. I'll be your Doug. <laughs> I'll be your hype man. Let's I'll go. get there for you. Hey, when was the last time you seriously considered your dreams? I mean, come on, you used to think about them all the time. What happened? I say it's time that you and your dreams got back together. I mean, think about it. You could live the van life in a totally customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. You could tour all 423 national parks, build a mountain cabin with your dad, or even start up your own business. Really, whatever you want to dream up. And it's a Mercedes-Benz van we're talking about here, kids. So expect innovative safety features like crosswind assist and blind spot assist. Expect amazing performance and reliability with an MBUX voice command system, a five-star dealer network, and an available gas engine. It runs like, well, a dream. So what do you say? Head to the Mercedes-Benz dealership and get that Sprinter van. Tell them your dream sent you. Hey everybody, what's up? Trey Wingo here. Welcome into season five of Half Forgotten History. We're delighted to be partnering once again with my friends at Mercedes-Benz as they have great conversations with great athletes and they tell us about the things that they had to overcome to achieve their dreams in life. Speaking of dreams, thanks to my friends at Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans, I've been able to realize my dream of having the perfect way to get to the golf course, go to a tailgate, or just get the whole family out of the house. Look, whatever your dreams are, Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans can help bring them to life. This week's guest was a big part of the victorious U.S. Ryder Cup team that annihilated the Europeans at Whistling Straits, Tony Finau. We talk about his rise, how he got into the game of golf, and how he finally got that all-important second PGA Tour win. Enjoy my conversation with Tony Finau. How good is it to be Tony Finau right now? <laughs> I mean, we're doing this pod, what, a week after uh, the Ryder Cup just absolute beatdown. Like, in terms of, like, how good you feel about everything, where are you on a scale of 1 to 10 right now? Yeah, well, I'm still I'm still on a high, Trey. No doubt about it. I feel like, uh, I mean, on a scale from 1 to 10, I'm... I'm um, pretty close to nine ten, no question. Um, it's been a great, it's been a great little stretch for me, you know, having having notched my second win just a couple months ago, even less than a couple months ago, maybe five six weeks ago, yeah. and then getting on that Ryder Cup team and, you know, to be a part of that squad, it's been a, it's been a nice little run, no question about it. We'll get to the second win and how important that was for you in, in a little bit, but I do want to focus on the Ryder Cup here because I'll tell you. It is my favorite sporting event of all time. And I, I've said this to any, I will die on this hill. I love like it's the, I love it's, that. it's the only sporting event I know where millionaires play for free. You know, and I get it. You get clothing and all kinds of stuff, but you're basically doing it just to do it. And I think that's <laughs> the coolest thing about it. And, and so for me, I had been as a golf fan, so frustrated so many times by these damn Europeans. And I like them. They're good people. Don't get me wrong. I'm hundred percent. I just like to see America win every once in a while. Yeah, exactly. um, I've sort of scoured the internet, come up with a bunch of things that people have called it. So you tell me, what do you, what do you like best? What should we refer to it as? I think the four play pod guys called it the slaughter by the water. <laughs> I came up with whistling straights, wipeout, straights flushed, the rider route, uh, the Wisconsin washout. I mean, what do you like? What name do you like about all that? Oh, all the ones that you just mentioned. I love the slaughter by the water. I mean, um, that's good. Pretty much I wish what, I'd come up with that one. Yeah, the slaughter by the water seems like a, a proper fit. It definitely was that. I mean, we had a heck of a squad. Um, you know, we we felt great leading in, but these things haven't gone our way. You know, that's it's no yeah. secret. In the last nine Ryder Cups, we've lost seven of them, um, and one. You know, a couple of those have been on home turf, so we haven't had the success that we've wanted. We've always had the better team on paper, and so we were highly favored in this one as well. We had the better team on paper, but um, I did have a great feeling going in and um, man, to be able to notch that win with this squad and these young guys, you know, that's the thing. It's, it's a whole different type of crew. We got a whole different, yeah. you know, we got a bunch of young guys, no scar tissue. Um, we obviously know the record, as I just mentioned, seven out of the last nine we've lost. We, we all know that, but a lot of us don't really have the scar tissue from those losses because we weren't a part of those teams. You know, I, myself I was, this is only my second Ryder Cup but um, I was a part of that loss in Paris and yeah. it was a big reason why I wanted to be a part of this team so I can you know try and try and get a W under our belt on home turf and so there's a few of us that were a part of that team in Paris but I think six out of the 12 guys that were on this team or even yeah six out of the 12 guys um, have no scar tissue and you know they were supposedly rookies but uh, I would say so more so they were rookies off the golf course on the golf course, these guys are studs. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, it, Scotty Scheffler was one of those guys that wasn't a part of it before, and all he did was take down John Rahm in singles. You know, it was interesting. <laughs> this this thing, uh, like you said, on paper it was a blowout, but I was nervous, like because yeah. if if we weren't going to win this one, I'm like, when are we ever going to win? So, yeah. so what was the message Stricker, Steve Stricker, the, the captain, gave you guys before the play? What did he What did he say to sort of put you guys in the right frame of mind? Well, that's a that's a crazy thing, and I put so I give so much credit to Strix. Um, he didn't say anything, you know, um, he, he gave us, we got there a week before as a team, he wanted us to meet as a, as a team the week before and see the golf course so we can get familiarized with it, but you know, before we got there the week of, and that's what we did. We got, we met as a team and, and, you know, when I saw the commitment from all our guys showing up, the only guy that wasn't there and, and his caddy was Brooks and he was, you know, we all know during the tour championship, he hurt his wrist. So he was kind of recovering from that. But all 11 guys, all the caddies, all the captains showed up to this practice. So I think that that type of commitment was huge um, for us. And then the only thing he said during that practice um, time was, you know, he wanted us to out prepare them. You know, let's prepare, prepare, prepare. Let's out prepare them. And that's really the only message he had, you know, leading up to the event the week of there were no pep talks. There was no there were no, uh, you know, late night talks, uh, motivational speeches from, from him or anything from him or any of the captains. So I think he trusted the play that got us to where we are and just our desire to win the Ryder Cup on our, uh, you know, kind of as a team. We we knew it was at stake and he didn't want to add, I think, any more pressure or make it more overwhelming than what it is. So really, he didn't, there wasn't really any 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 talks or anything. His thing during the practice rounds were, let's out prepare them and, and just prepare the best that you can. And then he let us kind of do our thing. You guys got off to a great start on Friday. You, you win that first session 3-1, which is exactly what happened in Paris, by the way, in 2018. And yeah. then it all fell apart. So what was the sense, or, or was there a sense like, okay, we've been here before, but we need to keep like, like we need to keep stepping on their throats, for lack of a better term? Yeah, 100%. So when I, I went out Friday afternoon with Harry, we were up yeah. 3-1. And uh, Strick said one thing to, to Harry and I off the tee. He said, that morning session's over. We need to win this session. He says, let's forget about that. And, and go win your match. So that was, it was short and sweet. And so that's what we knew we needed to do. But, um, you know, to get across that finish line, we were never complacent. And I think the reason why the score was what it was is because that was the case. We all knew that, um, the, again, these things just haven't gone our way. And, uh, but we wanted to, you know, prove that, you know, this is a team made up of a bunch of winners and guys that are hungry to, to bring the cup back home to the, to the States. So um, it was quite the team to be a part of. And, and to win in that type of fashion um, took everything that we had as a team and, and as captains to just continue to, to move forward. And that Friday morning and Friday afternoon sessions were huge. You know, it's, it's interesting. When, when it got around to singles, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion. By the way, you were great in that Friday afternoon session. You were dropping bombs left and right uh, on the greens. Did you, were you guys aware of the record at some point? Like, we have a chance to, to make this the biggest blowout win in Ryder Cup history. Was that something you guys even talked about? Oh, yeah. Uh, Saturday, Saturday evening. Um, again, no speeches. It was more just on a text thread. Um, we all kind of did our own thing Saturday evening. There was, again, there was no uh, planned dinners or anything, but the text thread was the record is 19. Let's get to 19. You know, Patrick Cantley gets on there. Well, you know, it's 20 sounds better to me than 19. So we knew 19 was the record and that that was the goal. Um, and not to take anything away from from the Europeans, but we felt like that was going to be attainable. For us going into Sunday, we were at 11. If we could get eight out of the 12 points on Sunday, there, there's the record, and you know we'd be the, the winningest team of uh, in points in the history of the Ryder Cup since they've changed from Great Britain right. to Europe, all of Europe. So um, that was the goal, and man, that's crazy. I was watching that last match coming down the stretch with with Boogie. I knew that he had to win it outright, and and he was able to do that on 18, and and there we were with uh, with 19 points and the best, really the best team of all time. 10-6 to 6 is the biggest comeback ever in Ryder Cup history on Sunday. It happened twice, 99 at Brookline, which is one of the craziest things of all time, and then uh, at 20, 2012 yeah. at, uh, uh, and, at Medina. So you knew, you knew it was coming, but when it finally sunk in, what was the first thing that went through your mind? There's no, there's no feeling like winning. You know, I've never won a Ryder Cup, so this is extremely special. As you mentioned before, you know, the Ryder Cup, in your eyes, is the greatest sporting event. It's the greatest sporting event in my eyes not only having watched it growing up, now having been a part of it, um, there's something special about this, about this event. Um, the passion that we show, because, 
we don't want to let our country down. We we're so proud to be from the U.S. They're so proud to be from Europe. We're we're playing under a flag. We're playing for each other. We're playing for our captains. There's you know I'm, I'm even just getting goosebumps just talking about it because it's it means so much to to represent your country. You know, and you don't have that opportunity to do that week in and week out. We don't have these opportunities. We don't have these opportunities to team up with these guys that we're usually trying to beat. Um, but when we come together as a team and um, and it pans out the way that it did at Whistling Straits, it was such a special feeling. Um, and I've uh, and Xander said it in the in the press conference right after we played. He says, I've never been over a loss so fast. And I, and I had lost my match as well. You know, I had a, a chance to put a blemish on, on Ian Poulter's um, singles record, which we all know is, is undefeated. I wasn't able to do that, but I've never been over a loss so fast. And it, you know, it's, it stings as a competitor. You want to add that extra point to your, to your team's total, but I couldn't help, but just celebrate with my guys and know that I was a part of something that was extremely special. And it was so fun to, um, to know that we had finally done something that uh, I think Americans can be proud of. And I think there's some promise for the future of American golf and Ryder Cups and President's Cup. Oh, listen, I mean, like, DJ's the oldest guy in the team at 37. I mean, that you, you talk about young crazy, pups on the squad, absolutely. You mentioned Xander, yeah. and I'm glad you brought that up because did he say anything before Sunday or before the matches? Because, you know, he he's, he's the only guy that sort of could explain what it means to win for your country, having won the gold medal – uh, at the Olympics in, in, in yeah. Tokyo. Did, did he share anything about what that was like that sort of helped you guys at all? Nah, he didn't, he didn't share anything uh, like that. Um, you know, I, I will say he, he, he celebrated uh, the hardest, you know, I mean, you guys saw the, you guys saw the, you guys saw the cigar. I think, you oh, know, yeah. my, my, fa- my favorite uh, Xander is a cigar Xander now. So um, I mean, my man was, you know, huffing and puffing uh, on his cigar all night and, um, and just had a great time celebrating. So yeah, um, not too much uh, talk about his gold medal. Um, I think as it was a team effort, um, but it's extremely cool. I mean, it's for him a gold medalist and a Ryder Cup champion in the the winningest fashion of all time in the same year. Um, that's that's ex- extremely rare. Maybe may never ever happen again. So yeah. um, kudos to to my man X. You know, this podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Intuit, and Intuit works for what you work for, just like Bryson and Brooks were able to put their differences together and work together for the win at the Ryder Cup. Tony, what was the dynamic like between those two that week? Yeah, you know, they they were able to put a lot of their differences aside, I think, for the week um, and and come together, again, for just a common goal. Um, they, they were great teammates to each other. Um, I don't think they would have minded even playing with each other, you know, to be quite honest. You know, it was... It was that type of feel. That would have that would have been a ballsy decision. I, I will say that. One hundred for one hundred percent, no question about it. But um, you know, I think it just speaks to the kind of camaraderie of the team. You know, we so many times, you know, and and so many of our Ryder Cups, um, the big question is why? Why can't Americans get along? Why can't the camaraderie be better? And I mean, to be a part of this team room and to see that all of our guys are invested in this and that, um, you know. I don't think it's just for a week, you know, to forge these type of relationships with these guys, um, you know, but Bryson and Brooks were able to get along just fine. You know, I sat at, I sat at the, you know, there was a handful of different tables in our team room. I sat at a table with him and Bryson almost the whole week. Um, and they were able to sit together and have a good time. So they had, they definitely are very different people. And, you know, I, they, I wouldn't see them hanging out, you know, uh, and having dinners together on the road. But for the week that it was, um, they were able to come together, and and all uh, it was all good vibes, nothing nothing crazy at all. Well, the good vibes continued in the post press conference when all you guys were up on the stage, and you know, as you said, X was a uh, X was a uh, that surgically attached stogie to his hand, which yeah. I, I think it might still be there. But one of my favorite moments at the press conference was someone asked Dustin. Uh, hey, you're the oldest guy in this group. Are you going to be able to hang with these guys and party? And his response was absolutely. So, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> did, did, he, did he did he come through? Was he able to keep up with everybody? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's known for you know he can party. There's no question about it. Um, I, I do. I will say he's getting a little older. You know, he didn't outperform. I think all the guys in in the celebration, but. If he wanted to, I'm sure he would. <laughs> he he had enough in reserve, is what you're telling me. Yeah, hundred percent. He's <laughs> yeah. He he's got it if he he's got it if he wants it. It's like that extra twenty yards. He needs to blow it by somebody on the 18th fairway. Um, all right. 100%. As you said, this has been the the sort of the 
the culmination of, of an unbelievable stretch for you. So why don't we take a quick break here and come back on this episode of Half Forgotten History with Tony Fee now about that long-anticipated second PGA Tour win. We're back with Tony Fina right after this. Hey, today's episode of Half Forgotten History is brought to you by Zelle. Zelle's a great way to send money to family or friends, no matter where they bank in the United States. I use Zelle. It's in my bank app, and I send money to my kids, even though they're in their mid-20s and they still want money from dad. Nobody's ever off the family plan. Trust me on this. With the holidays coming up, you can even discuss splitting the cost of a holiday dinner at a restaurant with friends and family or splitting the cost of a gift to send to your parents between all your siblings. Simply sending the gift of money, which is also a good idea. Uh, paying an individual craftsperson for a unique handmade gift or paying your friend back for your portion of the ice skate rental, ski vacation, whatever. You get the idea. Remember, money set goes straight into the recipient's bank account, typically in minutes between enrolled users. And you don't have to download another app because it's probably in your banking app already, like it is in mine. So look for Zelle in your banking app today. All right, back with Tony Finau now on this episode of Half Forgotten History, celebrating uh, a winning Ryder Cup team and, and really just an unbelievable year for you. Um, you know, you, you sort of, people that knew golf knew of Tony Finau, but, you know, you, you won in 2016 and then you just started compiling top tens, top fives, you were like an ATM machine. You know, you were just so reliable <laughs> and the cash was coming out. But that second tour win, and Max Homa said this once to me. He said the second win validates the first. And that's why you really wanted to go get that second one. That second one was elusive for you. How frustrating was it for you so often to be this close and not be able to get it over the finish line? Well, extremely frustrating, Trey. I mean, um, the thing about being a competitor and someone that looks at themselves as a winner is that you absolutely hate to lose. And when you do, it stings. And I've had many sleepless nights over, you know, I had a handful of playoffs yeah. um, in that, in that five year stretch that uh, didn't go my way. Um, you know, I had a chance to win a, a WGC and, and just, I, I've had opportunities and when they don't go your way, it's, it stings, you know, and, um, but you know, what I was able to do is just use that as fuel to get better. You know, I always told myself, well, you got to get better. You got to keep getting better. And so instead of thinking, when is it going to happen to me? It was just more like, it's going to happen. Just keep getting better. So, um, to finally get that, to notch that second one in the fashion that I did at the, at a playoff event. And again, I think at the time, what was so cool for me is my Ryder cup hopes were kind of in the balance. You know, I, I had, I had definitely been a guy that I'm sure Strix was keeping his eye on as I've been part of these teams. But to me, I needed to, I needed to win in my own eyes. And I, I, I told that to my team. I said, if I don't win, I don't feel worthy to be a part of this Ryder cup team. Um, you know, when you're in a, in a room full of guys, full of champions, full of major champions and things, you want to have that sense of belonging um, and knowing that you've had the year that is worthy of being a part of a Ryder cup team. Um, and so to me, it was a big deal in a lot of senses. You know, first, of course, notching that second one to validate the first one um, was huge. And especially having built up my resume the way I have, um, you know, to me, sports is, is all about winning. We know that, um, you know, so many critics were, well, he's not the guy to do that. So to be able to put that um, uh, to rest with this win and just the, the fashion that I was able to do it, I think was the more impressive thing. Um, you know, having taken on John Rahm and Justin Thomas and yeah. and these, you know, giants of our game uh, in these days uh, to be able to do that to 30 on the back nine and just really forge my way into that victory and not have it fall in my lap. I, I went and took it. And that's what that's what the big thing was for me was that I I was able to really perform well on a Sunday and and capture that win. And, and it boosted me right into right into the Ryder Cup and um, and, and hopefully you know, many more, many more ones to come. You mentioned, you know, frustration, you know, I, and I, and I mentioned Max Homa and you, know, you had, you had the, the playoff with him at Riviera in February and, yeah. you know, he was behind the tree and then, you know, you had a putt uh, to win it on the first playoff hole. Golf is hard because even when you're really good, you don't win that often. Like, you know, the best, that's why like yeah. Tiger to me will be the most dominant athlete I've ever seen in my life in any sport. Like it's, it's not even close. Yeah. Like he did things that you're just not yep. supposed Amen. to do uh, in, a, in a sport that doesn't <laughs> allow it. So how do you, how do you mentally, Tony, 
keep telling yourself, I'm going to get there. Because th- at some point, that becomes the burden, right? It's not, your, it's not your swing. It's not your putting stroke. It's like, I need to believe in myself. No question about it. Going back to Tiger just for a quick second. He, he dispels all the, any, any myths or anything about golf and, and all the reality. He kind of dispels all of it. So it's almost unfair to even, you know, when, 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 we, when somebody goes on a run these days, it's a, you know, five, six month stretch where they'll win two or three times. And, yeah. Oh, this is Tiger like. It's almost not even fair to, to mention because Tiger did it for 12 years and even more. And if we add his whole, you know, so it's, it's just crazy. Tiger is just like the anomaly of all anomalies. He, he's in a different universe, man. And, and I will die on that hill. And I'm glad, 100%. You, I'm glad you said it because people sometimes don't get it. Like they just don't get it what we saw for that 15 year stretch. Unbelievable. The dominance, uh, I don't think we'll ever see, like you said, ever, ever anything like it again. And, and the reason I think why you won't is because the level of play yeah. that he pushed the game to. And, you know, again, at that time, and he even Tiger, these are in his own words, at, at the time he was at his peak, when he would go to the gym, it would be two guys. It would be him and VJ. If you went to a PGA Tour gym these days, you can't get a seat at the Peloton bike. You can't, I mean, you can't even work out in the trailer. There's nine guys in there. And it only holds five guys in our trailer. So it's a whole different level that he pushed this game to. It's an actual sport. I think it's starting to be looked at as a sport. Um, I think a lot of that credibility comes from guys like Steph Curry, from MJ. These guys that are taking the task and trying to be a good golf player and having played for many years. So I think people start to understand this is a really, really hard game. To have someone like Tiger kind of head that whole thing and and dominate the way that he has, um, I think, you know... if you're involved in the game of golf and no sports, that type of dominance is just not, it's unheard of. But anyways, I had to throw that out there as just a huge, I'm a huge tiger advocate. I mean, what he's done for the game of golf and just in general, the dominance, we'll never see that again. And maybe never, ever in sports. Um, but going back to your question. So it's, it's incredibly hard to really overcome some of the, some of the demons that I, that I had, you know, um, to, to continue to believe in yourself, I think is an, is, is, is something that you have to work at. And that's something that I've been doing my whole life. You know, I think, and it goes back to me as a kid and overcoming obstacles as a minority golfer and as, you know, someone growing up and not having a coach uh, that was qualified to, to teach me a game. So I think a lot of the um, belief that I have in myself comes from my upbringing. And um, again, you know, I, I learned how to play golf inside, Trey. I learned how to play indoor into uh, hitting into a mattress that my dad thought was a great idea because he figured out that chipping and putting was free at the golf course. So we're going to do that at the golf course at the, at the local Muni right. hitting was too expensive, $7 a bucket and $10 to play nine holes. We couldn't afford. So he put this mattress inside our garage and simultaneously, if you can imagine a mattress in the middle of a garage, my brother and I would hit into the mattress. So he would walk kind of side to side and watch us hit balls. But that's how we learned how to play golf. And we would do this in the winter months. And sometimes in the summer, my dad would buy us a bucket for the week. And we'd go out and see the ball fly. And then we would go play tournaments. Um, But that type of upbringing, that type of humble upbringing, um, and and I noticed that that was a lot different than how most guys were doing it. It taught me that I, I, I had to believe in my process. I had to believe in my dad, someone that didn't even play the game of golf and that was teaching me how to play. And so I think my upbringing is the reason why I was able to overcome kind of quite the obstacle that I had in front of me, not having won in five years, having won a tournament that people are telling me that that's not a real tournament, the Puerto Rico open. I mean, anybody can win that tournament, right? So to listen to all that and, and in an era of social media and all that, I've kind of built up myself to, um, and my upbringing has kind of helped me to just continue to believe and, um, have faith that things are going to be better. I'm going to end up on the the good side of this if I just keep working at it. And and so that second win meant so much to me because of all those things. The thing I noticed when you won uh, at Barclays at Liberty National was the resolve in your face. It wasn't elation, like oh hey I've won it. It was like yeah I should have won it. Like I I knew I yeah. knew I had this in me. I, I think the up and down out of the bunker on either 18 or the first playoff hole I, I, to me that was yeah. like. That was tough, and you know, you knew you needed that one. But like, I what I noticed about it was just the resolve in your face. Like to me, and what you said afterwards was really cool. 
uh, you said, I'm, a, I'm such a better golfer now than I was when I won. So I've been waiting for this. But like, I, I just, yeah. I took away that, that it, it was, it, to me, it was a validation of what you already knew about yourself that second win. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And it's almost, it was almost a, more of a relief to me than it was this, uh, holy cow, I can do it. You know, I, I felt like I could do it. I knew I could do it. I believed it in my bones. To me, it was just when it happened. I was it was just going to prove myself right, um, and and just be able to now move from number two onto number three, and that's kind of how it felt. You know, it was great to celebrate that one and know that how much work had gone into it. And again, as I mentioned, Trey, is I had to become such a better golfer to overcome a lot of these things and overcome some of these emotions. So I'm I'm so much of a better player because of what I've been through. Um, I don't think I would have been the player I am today without all those losses and just taking all those you know, shots on the chin um, in some of those playoffs um, because I was able to learn from it and know that I just have to get better. And um, I've ended up on, you know, now getting that second win and becoming a stronger player because of it. Your story is really incredible. Like, like you said, you know, you, you didn't grow up in a, in a neighborhood of privilege or in a, in a house of privilege. You're the first Tongan Samoan descent player on, in the history of the PGA tour. Um, and, and, you know, you were sort of this mythical thing for people in golf. Like, you people, people, no, seriously, people may not know this. You had college basketball scholarships, and you turned them down to turn pro at the age of 17. Yeah, so, I, you know, the funny thing is, so uh, at Weber State, Weber State is a, is a school here in Utah. If you're in familiar yeah. sports, you'll know it. Weber sure. State in Utah State, I, I had offers from coming out of high school as I played high school basketball. And so I actually um, would have played with Damian Lillard. We were, we were the same age. We've been recruited at the same time. I didn't know that until obviously years later um, right. and, and seeing, you know, uh, seeing Damian on that team. But uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I love playing basketball. Basketball was my first love and I, and I enjoyed playing basketball my whole life. Um, but yeah, I would say we all have our own path and our own journey. And that was just part of mine. You know, I look at myself as an athlete that plays golf. And, and I think there's a lot of those types of players now on the tour and there's going to be only there's only going to be more. You know, you're going to see guys my size, six four, six five, even six six, maybe you know, 240 pounds that are you know hitting the ball as far as Bryson and, and chipping and putting as well as he is. So I think that's the interesting, the great thing about our game is it's evolving and um, becoming more of a mainstream sport. And so you're starting to see, and we have the money now to attract athletes. You know, and and it's a game that now you know you can actually make money in playing. So I think you're gonna start to get a lot of great athletes playing. And, but that's how I look at myself and, and a handful of guys on tour were athletes that happen to play golf. What made you want to turn pro at 17? Like what was, what was the motivation there? Yeah, well, it's a crazy, crazy story, Trey. I, I had no intentions of turning pro at a young age. I had only been playing. I was eight years old. I turned pro when I was 17. So I had <laughs> only crazy. been playing nine. I'd only been playing golf nine years when I turned pro. So uh, I had verbally committed to BYU, um, and so I was planning on playing B at BYU, and uh, springtime comes around my senior year, and it's time to sign. Uh, my dad approaches me, and he says, hey, I have um, a, a guy, uh, an investor that wants to help uh, pay for you and Gipper's entry fee into this big deal called the Ultimate Game, which is in Vegas. Yeah. So this is in 2007. Um, so my dad talks my brother and I into doing it and he says, look, we don't have to do, we don't have to turn pro or anything yet, but you know, if you guys, uh, win your couple matches, you know, we may have to, but I don't think that's, um, in you guys' best interest. I just, or I don't think that's going to happen, but I think this would be great exposure for you and your brother. So anyways, I end up playing and I end up winning my first two matches, which gets me into the final 12. So now I'm 12, one of 12 guys that have a chance at $2 million and it's a winner take all type stakes. Obviously, in our humble beginnings and our in our type of background, I basically meet with my parents and I say, "Look," and it was a big family meeting. I'll, I'll never forget it because this is exactly how I turned pro. Big family meeting. I'm with all my siblings, with my parents, and I and I tell them, I say, "Hey, um, this is a great opportunity, but I I've always wanted to go to college. I'm going to go to college. You know, education, as you guys have always preached to me, and all this." And my parents basically just shut me down. They're like, "Yeah, that's all great." But uh, no, you're going to you're going to turn pro and go ahead and try for that two million dollars. <laughs> so that's pretty much that was pretty much it, Trey. You know, I, I was on my way. I ended up being uh, one of 12 guys to have a crack at that, that two million dollars. And the funny thing is, now I look back at that tournament, the criteria to even have entered is you you can't have ever had Corn Ferry Tour status, PJ Tour status or Senior Tour status. 
uh, the Champions Tour status. So anybody could have signed up, amateur or professional. You just couldn't have had any of that status. And on out of those 12 guys that got to that final in 2007, um, there's four of us that's on the PGA Tour today, and that's Kevin Strillman, sure, Scott Piercy, uh, myself, and Spencer Levine. Wow. So the, out of the 12 guys, four of us are, are on the PGA Tour now, and so we kind of have that, uh, you know, starting grounds together and kind of that starting uh, talking points to our career. But anyway, so that's kind of how it happened. And from there, I was just on my way. You know, um, I turned professional, and and there I was trying to make it to the PGA Tour. Yeah, I mean, like people that have followed the game had heard about, hey, there's this kid. You know, he's really big. He hits it a mile. He's going to be a really, really good player. So like I said, this idea of Tony Finau becoming what you've become was sort of there for a while. But I think for most people, your coming out party might have been a disaster. And that was at the 2018 yeah. Masters. And for those that don't know, Tony, that was the first Masters that Tony qualified for. And he's playing in the par three event. Uh, and you have an ace. And that's anybody right. that gets an ace at Augusta, no matter where it is, par three or the regular tournament, you celebrate. So you are trucking down the fairway, arms up like this, going nuts. <laughs> you turn around to look back at the crowd and tell everybody what happened. Well, I turned around to look back at my, my family. My kids were catting for me and my wife was catting for me. And I ended up tripping up. Um, I'm going to call it a sprinkler head, but um, it may or may or may have not been there. But uh, I ended up tripping up and, and shattering my ankle. So I... I dislocate my ankle. It, my ankle comes out of the socket, and I feel it. It's my left ankle. So I get on. I get on one knee. Um, and anybody listening to this, you can just go on YouTube yeah. and watch it. But I get on. I get on one knee, and I pop it back in place. I just had felt. It's never happened to me, but I just felt how it how it turned over. So I just kind of kind of nudged it back, and it fell right back into place. And I got up, and I was able to walk away from the crime scene. So it was it was one of my greatest moments in my life. Potentially, you know, like the greatest, especially on the golf yeah. course of my life followed by absolute disaster. So it was quite embarrassing, um, but um, hey, that's, that's, that's why I was, I was introduced to the world kind of through that. What I remember is watching it, I'm like, oh, he must have done this before because you were just, oh, it just popped out. I'll just, I'll just pop it back in. I mean, it's not like a <laughs> finger, man. Your, your <laughs> ankle was out. Everybody assumed that. That's why I said that. It's never happened to me. Everybody assumed that that's happened to me. That's, that's never happened to me. Of course, I've sprained ankles playing a lot of basketball growing up. I've never had my ankle pop out of the socket like that. So again, I just felt how it was and I popped it back. And again, I was just happy. I was able to walk away from the crime scene, at least yeah. to make it least less embarrassing. It was still embarrassing, but if I were able, if I were just to lay there and they had to carry me out on the stretcher, that would have been the absolute nightmare. Well, not only that, but you go the next day and you shoot a 68. Okay. It's, it's your yeah. first, first official round at Augusta coming off a dislocated ankle you shoot a 68 on Thursday. Was there a moment where you were like, I might not be able to play? Oh, 100, yeah, 100%. There was a moment that I, I didn't think I was going to play. And that was when I woke up the next morning um, because the swelling had increased and yeah. the pressure on my foot had increased. So just walking down the stairs, I had to go get an MRI the following morning. My tea time was in the afternoon, luckily. And that was the saving grace of this whole thing is that if I have a morning tea time, I withdraw from the tournament. But I had, I had to go get an MRI um, or an x-ray on my on my ankle to see if there's any anything totally wrong with it um, and but walking down the stairs uh, at, at the room I was in um, I couldn't even move I had all my pressure on my arms I couldn't believe it. I said there's no chance I can play and a short you know six hours later from that time I kind of woke up I was playing uh, I was playing in my first master so it was it was it was the craziest week of my life no question about it but to, to have gone out and I mean, there's so much prep work, though. You know, my, my yeah. coach, he had to help me. We got to the range three hours before my tea time and readjusted how I was going to stand and um, ball position and all those things because I couldn't do what I normally do. I couldn't put my weight, transfer my weight to my left foot anymore. Uh, my trainer, Dr. Love, wrapping the heck out of my foot um, and making sure that I was, I was going to be stable enough to go and Nike, give, you know, sending me an extra pair of shoes. So there were so many things that had to happen for me to even play and I think there were a lot of prayers and uh, and thoughts in my favor because there's no way I should have even played. I don't think people understood what you just said. Look, I'm a hack golfer. I occasionally break 80 and I'm thrilled. But you just said you couldn't figure out your weight transfer. So in the middle of your first ever round at Augusta, you had to figure out how to do that. And oh, by the way, you went four, I think four under par that day. That's ridiculously impossible and hard for me to comprehend. Our sponsors over at Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans like to help make dreams come true. 
And I'm sure if you could dream it up, was that the best round you could have possibly gotten out of your body that day? Yeah, I had to, I had to, I couldn't transfer my weight. So I had to put the ball way back. Every single shot, my ball was on my right foot because that's the only way I was going to make clean contact. But my weight kind of had to stay there, you know, at best yeah. could put maybe 20% of, of transfer into my left side at best, you know, so hitting off my back foot. Um, but, you know, being a, a big, strong guy that I am, you know, I think I, I've always been an upper body type of swinger. So to me, it was definitely change of mechanics, but not extremely difficult, I felt, because um, I, I have always been an upper body type of uh, player, um, limited lower body motion. Um, so that, that was the only thing in my, in my favor. But I mean, to, to have gone out and done what I did, I mean, I look back now and I just shake my head. Getting a top 10 in any major yeah. championship, that's a great result. That's a successful week in any major championship on, on two great legs and on a full healthy body. To have done that on that golf course, to have walked around that place uh, with one wheel, I mean, it's, you know, it was, it was, it was quite, it was actually a miracle. You know, when I, when I yeah. walked off the 18th green, I mean, I could have fooled myself into thinking somebody was going to put a green jacket on me. <laughs> I, I felt that, I felt that great. So, first of all, this is why like regular golfers hate people like you. Okay. I'm just telling you, like <laughs> the, the idea of not only I have a bum ankle, I've got to figure out a, a, a way to work it. And then I'm going to go shoot a 68 and finish in a top 10, which means I get invited back to Augusta. This yeah. is why this is why the rest of us who play this game are so frustrated by people like you, just so you're aware. OK, <laughs> well, um, it was a dream, but it, it it was does, a dream week. Uh, it does speak to the athleticism that you talk about, though, with these guys on tour. Um, and, and the other thing that I remember about you also that year, uh, you were trying to get in and maybe make the 2018 Ryder Cup, which you did. You were paired at the PGA at Bell Reeve that year. Uh, when Brooks won and, and, you know, Tiger was trying to chase him down on Sunday, yeah. you were paired with Jim Furyk, who was going to be, it was the Ryder cup captain. And I think you had like nine birdies in the round or was it 10? Did you have 10 birdies in that round? 10. Yeah. I had 10. Yeah. yeah That's crazy. It was unbelievable. So, it was unbelievable. Round, yeah. I, but, but I feel like from what you said earlier, you just need to pretend like you need to make a Ryder cup team and you're going to win all the time. Right, because you you said you wanted to you wanted to validate being on the Ryder Cup team by winning, so you win you win Barclays in a in a, in a, a playoff. You you want to make the Ryder Cup team in 2018, so you're paired with the captain and you shoot 10 birdies. I think your new <laughs> mental attitude should just be every yeah. week. I need to get on the Ryder Cup team, so I'm going to play really well this week. Yeah, I think you're right. That was at Bell Reeve, and the funny thing is, uh, Xander and I were the ones playing with Furyk, and we knew what that was. We we knew. Basically, like, look, this is like a tryout, guys, you know. Yeah. Um, whichever one of you guys play better, most likely is going to be the one that made the team. And that ended up being true. It came down to Xander and I being the last pick, and, and I ended up getting picked. Um, and I think that was a huge part of the reason was we played with Furyk at Bell Reeve, and I had 10 birdies in my in my second round, um, which is, I think, the most it's high for the most birdies with Gary Player all time in a PGA Championship round. But, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that is the that's the new mo. You know, I, I can just hire you as my psychologist now, Trey. You can just be my yes. guy. Just say, let's go. Hey, Ryder Cup is next week. Yeah. You need to win this week. Let's make it happen. I'll be your Doug. <laughs> I'll be your hype man. Let's I'll go get there for you. All right. So, what's the next thing for you? Like, like you said, you you got that second win. You've been on a Ryder Cup team. What's the next golf goal that Tony Finau wants to accomplish? Yeah. Well, win number three. There's no rest for the weary. Um, you know, sports, as I mentioned before, sports is all about winning. So, you know, for me, I was just getting my body and my mind right after the Ryder Cup. It was fun to celebrate. Um, you know, now we flip the page and, and get ready for the start of my eighth season, you know, which is, is crazy for me to think. I can't believe um, time has flown by this fast. You know, I, a lot of those things that you mentioned are great, great memories. Um, they, they seem like, you know, it's, they don't seem that long ago um, that a lot of these things happen. And here I am starting my eighth season. So, um Win number three is, is, is what's up on the plate. But, you know, to me, I, I just I've learned how to enjoy the process of trying to get better. And that's always what it's that's always what it's about, you know, step by step, um, you know, one percent better every day. You know, I, I, I try to preach that. And, and, and my coach as well to me is we can only try our best to put our you know one foot in front of the other as we go through life. And that's that's all we're trying to do. So hopefully that stacks up for for me nicely and, and I'm able to get get some wins this eighth season well I, I think a lot of people feel like once you got that second one sort of the the top's coming off the can and we're going to see a lot more of tony finau uh in the winner's circle on the pga tour let's take our, our final break here and come back i got some rapid fire questions for you and i also want to hear about some of the things you've got going stay with us tony finau coming right back on half forgotten history 
This episode of Half Forgotten History is brought to you by Intuit, the company powering products like TurboTax, QuickBooks, Mint, and Credit Karma. Intuit works for what you work for, and whether that's a small business or just you as an individual, Intuit's innovative products make managing your finances and setting yourself or your business up for success very simple. For anyone out there using TurboTax online, their error recognition tool catches mistakes you might have missed. Like when I input my bank information to get my tax return, if I misplace a digit in my routing number, my refund could get delayed for weeks. Luckily, Intuit has my back and will detect common errors like these on the fly so that you can correct it and get your return on time. QuickBooks helps you manage your business all in one place from tracking everyday expenses to being ready for tax time. You can also send invoices, receive payments, run payroll, and track future cash flow right inside QuickBooks. Even if you don't own a small business, Mint's budgeting tools and recommendations are there to help you save for whatever, like saving up to go golfing at a number of the top golf courses across the country. Discover how Intuit's innovative products can help you see what's possible at Intuit.com. All right, back to wrap up this uh, episode of Half Forgotten History with Tony Fee. Now, a couple of quick questions for you. You said you, uh, you, know, you, you were going to play basketball in college. Gary Woodland, U.S. Open champ. Uh, did play basketball in college one on one Woodland versus you? Who's winning? Me. You're just gonna post yeah. him up all day? Yeah, I'm, I'm a great shooter. I'm bigger than him, taller than him, longer than him. Um, I'll take my chances, but uh, and I think I, I just played a lot more basketball than him lately. You know, I my manager I'm sure hates to hates to hear this, but <laughs> I, I, I still play I still play a lot of pickup, and um, so I, I think I'll just be less rusty than him. He has way more experience than me, obviously playing at the at the college level. And I think he's an amazing basketball player. I've seen his highlights. He's an amazing athlete. He's got great speed in golf. And so, you know, he's got it all there. Um, but I'll, I'll take me in a one-on-one. Plus, if you pop your ankle out, you can just pop it back in. You'll be fine. Yeah, that's, um, right. that's right. Okay. So the the next question, all these guys, you mentioned Woodland, uh, Brooks want to be a baseball player. You were going to be a basketball player. What is it about you guys just being able to pick up this game of golf? and like, well, I guess I can do this as well. I can only speak for myself. Um, yeah. My dad didn't know how to play. My dad, I have no history of golf in my family. And as you mentioned before, at, uh, in the middle of the show, I'm the first of Tongan and someone descent. I should have no reason, you know, I shouldn't even think I can accomplish something like playing golf. But I think um, if I knew better, I would be, I'd be worse off. You know, I think yeah. I didn't know how hard the game was. My dad didn't know how hard the game was. So we played it as if, uh, you're expected to win and expected to be good right away. And that's kind of how I learned how to play the game. Um, and so I think I kind of fast tracked myself just with that type of confidence and, um, and just not understanding how hard the game should be. So I was able to just take um, uh, my dad was able to just take the experience he had in other sports right into golf. And again, if I knew how hard the game was and how hard it's supposed to be, I probably wouldn't be where I am today, but yeah, I, you know, I was happy that we didn't because we were able to just, expect to do be great at golf right away we didn't think that game was that hard just take this club and put this ball in the hole and we, we kind of kept it that simple um and obviously as we learned and grew we knew that the, it, it isn't it isn't that simple but we were kind of you know our both of our feet were in the into the game already by that point so i can only speak on my own experience and that's kind of how um i think i was able to to just kind of fast track my way to um, becoming a professional golfer yeah, sometimes uh, it, it's a victory for the uncluttered mind. What you don't know sometimes is better than what you do know. Yeah, um, amen, and that's how it was for me. Yeah, Dream pairing, like in a, in a final round for a major, who would you want to be paired with? Is there one guy you'd like to be going, be going up against? Yeah, well, for me, it would be Tiger. You know, I had that opportunity in 19. I'd love that opportunity again um, after Tiger. Um, you know, just, just because I, I'm going to have the opportunity, I feel like, to play with all our modern guys. So I'm only going to name guys from the past, you know, um, Jack and Lee Trevino is a guy that, you know, I love his story. I love his golf swing and everything he, he's, he's about. So those are a few guys that I have on my list for sure. Obviously you want to win a major. Is there one major that means more to you than anything else? Yeah. The masters, um, the masters means everything. I think it's, it's the first tournament I ever watched was the 1997 masters. Um, and so it's 100%, it's 100% the masters. And tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. I, I know that we had you on the radio show before and your foundation is doing great things. Tell us a little bit about the Tony Fino Foundation. Yeah, thanks. So I think one of the cool initiatives that we just started at the Tony Fino Foundation is uh, Birdies for Books. <clears throat> reading has been a huge part of my life. My parents have uh, preached reading to me since I can remember. 
Um, and it's been a great way for me to attain knowledge. You know, I, I'm a high school uh, graduate. You know, that's the highest uh, level of education that I have. Um, but I think a way that I've been able to learn um, and learn from so many great minds uh, of this world um, and, and, and just so many great people was from reading. So I'm a huge advocate for reading and especially for our youth. So we started this initiative, Birdies for Books. Uh, every birdie I make is, is $25 on a three-day tour. Every eagle is 50. Hole-in-ones are 1,000. If I want a golf term, it's 1,000 books. And it's donated across the state of Utah. Um, but I'm able to provide tutors as well for these kids. So not only do they have the books, but they have the resources to, to help them read. So that's something that's been huge for us these last, um, this past season. Um, but our, our foundation has been doing great. You know, I have a lot of great support from, from uh, the state of Utah, all my sponsors. Um, we're working with the underprivileged kids and broken families. It's uh, an area that I feel like I, I know because I grew up in an area that had a lot of this, uh, a lot of drugs and alcohol and uh, a gang infested place. So, um, a place that we can, a place where we can help kids, um, is kind of what we're working towards, uh, a learning center similar to Tiger Woods Foundation and, um, and, and things like that. But the, the physical evidence of seeing, um, the help that we've been able to provide uh, a lot of kids and a lot of the youth and, in Utah and their families uh, has been has been so worth every every ounce of energy that we put into this foundation. Uh, that, that's awesome. You can check out the Tony Finau Foundation online. Um, do you have a favorite author or a favorite book? I'm reading one right now. It's called Twelve Rules of Life: An Antidote for Chaos. Uh, it's Jordan Peterson. He's actually like a philosopher out of Canada. I like a lot of his work. Um, Clayton Christensen is someone I think I would say is is probably right at the top of my list of authors. Clayton Christensen. He's written handful of innovation books and i think he's amazing all right well so you are definitely into the uh the sort of the self-help self-learning yes uh thanks 100%. With books. all right yeah. i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you one title it's one of my favorite books of all time it's called a prayer for owen meany it was written by john irving now it's fiction but i i think you'll really like it a prayer for okay. owen meany all right i'll put it on the list all right and uh, you're new now jumping into the podcast game <laughs> yeah so i started my uh, Boyd Summerhays, my coach, uh, and myself, we started a podcast called Let's Get It, um, where we just kind of talked all things, our life and golf. And it's been a great way to kind of journal our journey uh, uh, through this professional life. So I think we started it in either 17 or 18. So it's been a few years. Um, and it, again, it's just a great way to put our thoughts out there and, yeah. um, and, and have people kind of pay attention to what we're doing and, and hopefully inspire some people to, uh, to be better. Well, listen, uh, I'll, I'll check it out. And I appreciate you being on uh, my pod. And you have certainly inspired me uh i'm gonna try and go out there and see if i can now play with all my weight on my right foot because i can't get over to my left i love it thanks Trey. thanks for having me on always enjoy being with you so once again thanks to tony finau for joining us and i look forward to seeing many many more wins in his pga tour career that'll do it for this week's show but coming up next week the very inspirational story of former steelers linebacker ryan shazier how he was at the absolute bottom and the worst place you could be in the nfl and came back to reclaim, quite frankly, his life. That's next week. We'll see you then.